Uh, Dolly, I'm on deadline, so if you don't mind, I'll just go ahead if my associates don't she's mind. She's on deadline. If folks don't mind, she's going to go right ahead. I think she's going to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with the clock spinning yeah. around. Anyway, okay. Dolly, welcome back to Dallas. It's lovely to well, see you. Well, you thank you. Thank you for you again. choosing our city as one of the stops on your tour. And we all know, of course, you're here in connection with promoting your new album, The Great Pretender. None of those songs are written by Dolly Parton. They're all standard pop favorites, all hits recorded by somebody else. Now, obviously, you wanted to do this album or you wouldn't have done it. But what about the fans? Uh, what do the fans think of this album? Well, I really don't know what they think just yet because the album is just new out. It's something I wanted to do for a long time because I have always re either recorded my own songs or songs that were written by somebody else that were all new and nobody, as a singer, had ever heard me uh, sing anything outside new material. And uh, when we came off of uh, um, Islands in the Stream with Kenny Rogers, we got a lot of pop play on that. And in the summer, we're releasing a new movie called Rhinestone, and it's all very, very country. Some of the best things that I've written in a long time. And I just thought it might be a, a smart business move on my part, since this was something I've wanted to do for years and never had really a great reason. I just thought it might be a good time to do it, to to bridge that gap in between uh, the, you know, the pop things and, and the country album that will come out that most likely will just be you know, played on country stations. Hopefully we'll cross over, but if not. Uh, and it's just something I wanted to do as a singer, as a performer, and being a person responsible for my own decisions, only hope that the fans would like it, assuming that they loved those songs as much as I did when uh, they were growing up, the country fans that are my age which is 38 now. <laughs> but I just thought that maybe it's something that I could do and that they would enjoy. And I don't know how they really feel, but I hope they like it. The critics have given mixed reactions to it, Dolly. I wonder, does it matter as far as record sales, what critics think or write? I think it matters to a degree what critics say about movies and about albums. If a song is a big hit, if it's something great, I think that the public would buy it, even if you had, if you were a chainsaw murderer, if they loved what you were putting out, if it's something that touched them and that they wanted to do. I do think that it has an effect, especially in uh, movies, and, and that's something I'm, I'm doing now and I'm enjoying. But uh, I think it's sometimes a bit unfair when they don't know what all you've put into it, what all you were thinking what all you know what all you were feeling and hoping that you could do for the fans as well as yourself you always hope as a business person to make money and you always hope to be famous as a performer and you know to do good and you would love for everybody to love everything you do but they can't and I think sometimes they don't look a little you know they should look a little deeper before they really just cut you in you know in half uh, but uh, I think it has some effect but I don't think it s totally stops the record has there ever been an instance where you have gotten either a fantastic review and the sales didn't reflect that, or where you have had a mediocre review and it didn't matter, things <laughs> just went uh, to the top anyway? I've never remembered an album or a movie that didn't have mixed. Some people love it because they may be a fan of yours. Some hate it because they don't even know what you do or they're not a fan. Uh, I think that you get mixed reviews, and that's fine. That's their job as well as ours. But um, I think that um, sometimes it, I, I always try to look at both sides. I love a great review. Anybody would. Everybody likes for everybody to think well of them. But when, the, when there's a bad one, I try to look real deep and think, you know, wow, what really they base that on. Maybe something I can apply to something else later on. And uh, I think it's always mixed. Rhinestone is coming out in June, right? June 22nd, the Rhinestone With movie. With Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. And uh, the movie got off to a kind of a rocky start, didn't it? Because the first if director... If you pardon the expression. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A rocky start. <laughs> yeah. Because the first director was replaced. And then, uh, and I talked with Mr. Worth about this just a few weeks ago. First director was replaced by Bob Clark. Clark came in thinking that maybe he would use some of the footage ended up not being able to use any of the footage, as I understand it from Mr. Worth, uh, any of the footage of the mm -hmm. first director. Is that right? He 
wound up not using That's any right. of the footage rather than not being able to use. But anytime you're working with directors, a good director, and they both were good directors. The first director was Don Zimmerman, one of the greatest, sweetest people I ever met. He had to, they said, they say, pull out of the movie for personal reasons. I don't know if it was family problems or whatever. And I think that it was his first directing job. We, had, we just had started, and I was so involved in the, uh, in the music of the movie that I wasn't really paying that much attention. I was just there to do my job, and I was having all I could do to get my work done, working with, with Sly, with the music, and with myself, and you know, just getting all the things in order for me. But when he left, Bob came in. He was a more aggressive person. Not to say that either one was better or worse as a director, but just a different approach. And Bob uh, just, when we started working, it just recreated almost the characters. And the stuff that we had shot was a little, you know, it was just a little different. And it just didn't fit well together. It'd be like if I used, you know, two producers on an album. If I had done the Great Pretender album, say, and had two producers, there would have been a different approach to, to the music. So I think both directors were good, but I think Bob Clark was a great idea, smart idea. He, he is an actor as well, and he knows how to, how to bring it out of you, and he's just a real direct, aggressive person. And I really enjoyed working with him. I, I learned a lot working with him as a director. Did your character change from one director to the other? Well, no, but the, my character was the same, mine especially. I think Sly's character changed more because uh, of, he was a more aggressive personality. Mine was more the country girl anyway. My character was basically the same, but how we worked against each other had a lot to do with, you know, getting it just right with, you know, working with the director and with the, you know, with the other personality, which was Sly. But uh, I think the movie has worked real well. I think that either director would have been fine. It's just that uh, there was just a difference in their approach. Thank you, Dolly. Thank you. I loved him. I'd heard a lot of stories about him that he was hard and uh, macho and hard to deal with and this and that, but I didn't find that true with me. I think he's a very creative person, a lot of great energy, and he's real quick, real bright, and we just had a great time. And uh, I think this particular movie was easy for both of us because, like I say, the character that I played, which was Jake Ferris, a country singer from Nashville, went to New York to sing in a club called the Rhinestone. And uh, he was a New York City cab driver, which he once was in real life. And I think this is uh, really his true personality, because this is his first comedy. And he does do some singing in this movie, although it's not a musical. It's a story about music and the music business. And uh, we do bits and pieces of songs, and three songs done in their entirety from stage. But I really loved working with him. He's, he's a nice man. And pretty too. <laughs> I didn't. Oh, did he have problems with the directors? Not to my knowledge. I didn't see it. If he did, if he did, it was strictly behind the scenes. Uh, because the first director was and is one of his best friends. Don Zimmerman was um, uh, an editor that had worked on all of Sly's films and probably will work on the others. And this was his first directing job you know, as just an all-out director. And maybe he just didn't want to do it or whatever, and uh, I don't know, but he didn't, uh, I didn't see that on the set, let's put it that way. Liz Smith, I think, started a rumor in her column that the Lone's voice is actually pretty good in this, is that true? Well, Sly does not have a great voice if you're waiting for Sinatra or Tom Jones or Elvis Presley, but what he does have that I think is real commercial and is real workable is a lot of heart, a lot of soul and a lot of energy and we did all these things live he was bold enough to do it because we both felt and I certainly felt as being the musical supervisor that knowing his personality that we could get a lot more out of just playing off of each other and and just filming the moment rather than trying to lip sync and you know do all the stuff that you usually do in those you know the musicals or whatever but I, I like his singing I think he's going to have a lot of uh, success especially in the country music market, because I also tried to cater these songs since I wrote them all according to the personalities of, of us and the character in the movie and his range and his voice quality, rather than trying to write beautiful, great love songs that you'd notice every bad note or good note. 
I tried to fix it to where we could get away with it, and I don't think we did. Will the two of you have duets on the soundtrack? Yeah. There'll be at least three duets that will be singles. He'll have um, at least one solo. Uh, probably will be the first single for him, and I'll have a single myself, and then we'll go into the duets. I think we might have a real successful project. I'm a dreamer, of course, but I believe it, really. And I, I normally would shy away from, I would say something else if I wasn't really confident about it. I just feel like we've got a real special project. I'm writing some television series, not for me, but for some other people. Uh, somebody else asked me that yesterday. Yeah, okay, well, however, okay. This is stand-up, take one. Dolly Parton hasn't toured for a year and a half, but she hopes visits like this will let everybody know Dolly Parton is alive and well and still making albums. Bobby Wygant, uh, okay. Okay, go. Take two, stand-up, take two. Dolly Parton hasn't toured for a year and a half, but she hopes visits like this will let Take, take three. Dolly Parton hasn't toured for a year and a half, but she hopes visits like this will let everybody know Dolly Parton is alive and well and still making albums. Bobby Wygant at Los Anatole Hotel in Dallas for Channel 5 Action News. One more. All right. You want to check any levels or anything? Okay. Uh, this will be then take four, I believe. Take four. Dolly Parton hasn't toured for a year and a half, but she hopes visits like this will let everybody know Dolly Parton is alive and well and still making albums. Bobby Wygant at Los Anatole in Dallas for Channel 5 Action News.